Hi everyone, my name is Ethan Tenchoko, and today we'll be going over the reproductive system and more specifically gonad determination, modes of reproduction, pregnant, and the pregnancy process. Okay. So the gonad determination is essentially when we're taking an embryonic sex organ and we're determining whether it's going to become male reproductive organs or the female reproductive organs. And so they both start off at a similar point. It's called the bipotential gonads. Uh, it's this alien looking structure right here. And so let's start off with the uh, male case. So in order to uh, turn into male reproductive structure, we have to have the presence of what we call the SRY gene, or as I like to say, the SARI gene. Okay, and so the presence of the SARI gene will turn a set of bipotential gonads into the male gonads. Sorry to this man. Sorry to this man. And so what this SARI gene does is it turns these um, ball looking structures into um, the embryonic testes. Okay. And so what the embryonic testes do is they secrete two different types of hormones, okay? So there is testosterone and there is AMH or anti-malarian hormone, okay? One of the um, functions of testosterone is to increase the male duct. So in this case, we are taking the male tubes, okay? And we are increasing them, we're developing them even more and then also testosterone is going to turn into DHT, and DHT is a hormone which will masculinize the genitalia, so it, it's kind of just making it, I, there's a more better way to describe it, but essentially it's making the reproductive structure look more phallic, okay? So we're kind of just like turning it into an elongated tube, if you will. And then um, the other hormone, anti-malarian hormone, will reduce the female duct, okay? So in this, uh, remember that bipotential gonads have both male and female tubes, but we need to use a hormone to reduce the, the, um, the tubes for the sex that we're not becoming. So in this case, we're turning into a male, so we have to reduce the female tubes, okay? And then so, after all of this development, we are going to get to the fully developed testes, as you can see here. And so the fully developed male tubes are what we call the vas deferens. And then we have a mature set of testes right here. Okay. And then the way I remember it, although it may seem kind of dumb, but you'd be surprised at how well it helps you remember it, is the fact that you can think of, based on the way it looks, the mature re male reproductive organs kind of look like arms to me, at least. Okay. And then so I use the way it looks to determine that, oh, this is how the male reproductive organs develop. Okay. So now let's look at the female case. So for females, we have no SAR, um, SARI gene, okay? And so because of that, these ball-looking ball structures will not become embryonic uh, testes, and by default, they become embryonic ovaries, okay? And so once embryonic ovaries develop, we do not have the production of testosterone or AMH, okay? And then so again, by um, the, the standard development, okay, we are going to have the female ducts increase while the male ducts will decrease. And therefore, um, we are going to enter the, fe we've entered the female pathway, okay? And then in this case, the fully developed uh, female reproductive structure are the ovaries and the oviducts, okay? And then the way I remember this is, to me at least, it looks like long hair. Okay, as you can see right here. 
All right, so our next topic is going to be modes of reproduction. So for the most part, these were um, pretty straightforward in Dr. Campbell's lecture. So I'll only go through or skim by most of them, but just go through a little bit more detail on the ones that she didn't really explain that much, okay? So let's start off with fission. So fission is essentially we're taking a parent cell and then we're just going to split it in half, okay? And then we formed two uh, identical daughter cells. So both of these are 2N, so diploid, and they are identical to the parent cell. Okay. For fragmentation, it's a similar process, except what's happening is we're taking a portion or a fragment of the parent cell, and that fragment is going to turn into a fully developed parent cell. So in this case, we have a starfish, and sorry, Patrick, but we're going to cut off his arm, okay? And so this cut off arm in fragmentation is gonna turn into a fully developed starfish. And then the one without, the one that just lost its arm is going to regenerate that arm and it'll become, and we'll have two identical starfish essentially. And so that's fragmentation. The next type of asexual reproduction is parthenogenesis. And so in this case, we are the basis of parthenogenesis is we're taking an N haploid egg cell from the mom that the one set of chromosomes will go through a, um, they're, they're going to duplicate. And then we're going to get a 2N egg that, ha that consists of two maternal genomes, okay? So the first type is going to be obligate parthenogenesis. This is essentially we have a female only, and so they can have male and female behaviors, but at the basis, they are only have egg cells, so therefore they are only female. We have facultative, and so these have asexual cycles, so they uh, reproduce by parthenogenesis, but they also have sexual reproduction cycles where they, a male fertilizes the female egg and then therefore develops a child that way. We also have what we call the haplodiploid. And so for haplodiploids, it's kind of a special case where we have asexual and sexual cycles. But for the sexual cycle, we'll have the female, okay? It's going to produce a haploid male. In the case of the sexual cycle, we'll have a male fertilizing the female egg and they'll produce a diploid species right here that is always going to be female okay and so the last mode of reproduction we have is sexual reproduction we won't go over too much of what classical is but for hermaphroditism we essentially have simultaneous and sequential so simultaneous emphasis on the fact that it's both male and female so they have sperm and egg cells at the same time Whereas for sequential, it's a female and then a male or vice versa, okay? All right, and so now we're at our last topic, which is pregnancy development. And so this is a pretty um, complex diagram, but for the most part, I just took all of Dr. Campbell's slides and com com um, combined it into a single um, pathway or chart, okay? And so I won't be able to go through everything in this, but I'll go through the main core of this, um, the overall process, okay? And just to start off, we have implantation. And so with implantation, we have our blastocyst is going to essentially sit in the uterine wall. And then in the transition to the first trimester, the uterine wall is going to form the outer layer of the placenta, whereas the top layer or the trophoblast of the blastocyst is going to turn into the placenta in general. Now with first trimester we have hormone production and physical development. For physical development it's best characterized as we are forming the baseline or the basics of a human. So where are the main functions or things that you need in order to form a human? In this case it's the main organ, organ systems, its sex, and the umbilical cord, which is important for nutrient and waste and gas exchange, okay? For hormones, the placenta is uh, secreting HCG, which causes the ovaries to produce progesterone, and then the placenta is also secreting estradiol. 
from here, there are two potential paths. Uh, there is if you have incorrect chromosome numbers, so this is telling us that the uh, resulting embryo is not fit for life, and th therefore the body will stop the pregnancy. However, if you have correct chromosome number, which is telling the body or signaling it that this embryo can develop normally, then we'll continue on to the second and third trimester, which is characterized by, for physical development at least, is just characterized mainly by growth, where you have brain development, fetal movement, and organs that are not critical, not that critical for life are, are going to develop here. For hormones, the placenta will no longer secrete HCG, and that's because it can develop its own progesterone. So it's the placenta itself that's producing progesterone, not the ovaries. And then it is still secreting estradiol, as you see right here. Okay. And then so at the end of the third trimester, we obviously go into labor. And so the main thing to consider here is that estradiol, note that through the first, second, and third trimester, we've been secreting estradiol throughout. And then what this estradiol is doing is we're, it's going to um, act as a transcription factor for oxytocin receptor genes. And so these receptor genes are going to cause the production of more oxytocin receptors. These oxytocin receptors are therefore going to bind to oxytocin, and then this is going to cause the resulting pathway, in um, which oxytocin will induce uterine contraction. These uterine contractions will cause the production of more oxytocin, and um, it will just continue in a feed-forward positive feedback loop. Overall, these uterine contractions are the main point of them is to just essentially over time push out our um, the uh, resulting baby okay and so yeah that's the main core of this uh, obviously you can go and pause this right now and go through each of these steps in more depth and go through everything that I've written out for you and so for the most part, that is it for this video and stay safe out there, guys.